Welcome back inside Raymond James. ESPN Plus halftime report continues. Second half just around the corner. Rutgers taking a 21 10 lead into the final 30 minutes. John, let's take a look at our PNC first half highlights. Well, it all started when Rutgers had the football and Mike Teal on the quarterback draw calls his own number and gets in to start the scoring at 7 0 Rutgers. Then the interception by Jason McCourtney. He steps inside from the cornerback position, goes 30 yards for another touchdown. But USF answers. Big tough running up the middle. Ben Williams from five yards out. But then Teal comes back to Jack Corcoran for the touchdown. That leads us to the 21 10 lead from the Scarlet Knights. And the quarterback comparison, we said at the top, Matt Grothy was going to have to play flawlessly. He hasn't so far. Two interceptions, 15 of 24. Conversely, Mike Teal, 9 of 15, but he's turned it over a couple times as well. So the season is on the line for Matt Grothy and the USF Bulls. They have to find a way to come back against Mike Teal and score. They have to shut him down. They have to shut Mike Teal down in the second half and come back and score points offensively. It's going to be interesting in the third quarter for Mike Teal and company because no one has success against the Bulls in the third quarter. Yeah, in the third quarter, the USF Bulls have outscored opponents 69 to seven and that seven points was really a return so no one's really scored on this defense in the third quarter this year. Well Rutgers uh, won the opening toss they deferred they'll take the football here in the second half with the lead and there's a fumble live football and the Scarlet Knights uh, get it back. Uh, Jason McCourty took it back and he coughed it up and Rutgers gets it. And that would have been huge for the Bulls here in the third quarter. Well, that's exactly the way the Bulls wanted to start. Big time special teams hit. It looked like Perkins, Cameron Perkins coming down on the special teams. Just gets a helmet low and then the strip on the outside may have been Quentin Washington or Jerome Murphy coming down as well. So big time special teams play to start the second half. Rolls forward, a uh, gain of one, maybe two. Terrell McClain uh, making the initial contact up front for the Bulls. Yeah, and a good play also by Jared Bowie coming down from the offside away from George Selvey. Doing a nice job coming down the line of scrimmage and making the tackle on the, on the ball carrier as well. You know, Quint mentioned the heats, and of course, uh, Greg Schiano used to coach at Miami. He said it's a lot easier for a team to go up north and block out the cold than it is a team from the north coming down to the south. So far, uh, the weather hasn't bothered him. Human in the first half, the weather conditions almost perfect here in the second half. Teal comes out throwing, has his man, and it's complete. It's going to be a first down. Let's go downstairs with Quint. Mike, we're going to keep our eyes on that heat issue now as the second half goes on. I spoke to both uh, head coaches. The key, they said, is the converse, uh, converting off of the turnovers. And right now, Rutgers has the advantage there. Wally Burnham, defensive coordinator for South Florida, most pleased with the fact that Rutgers' longest completion is only 35 yards. He says his safeties and corners are doing an excellent job of keeping the Rutgers receivers in front of his defensive unit. He also said they're picking on his middle linebacker, Keon Wilson, in some third down situations with some crossing routes. Well, Keon Wilson, uh, a rookie, basically, coming from junior college. And, of course, uh, that USF linebacking course shuffled a little bit with, with Bruce uh, Montpremier not playing. Yeah, that's big for the Bulls. They don't have a lot of experience in the middle of that defense. And that's why you see defensive coordinator Wally Burnham moving Carlton Williams from the safety spot down to be really one of those linebackers playing the edge to help out guys like Keon Wilson in the middle and, and Joseph. Keon Wilson, though. Wally Burnham saying getting better and better. He had 11 tackles at Cincinnati. Single back is smart neck. Tries to break to the outside, and he is one hard. You know, Martinek, we talked about penalty flag down. We talked earlier in the broadcast about his 45-yard touchdown run, and he said, uh, Greg Schiano saying that one of the four backs could be the guy. He said this guy came back after the 45-yard touchdown run, made a tackle on the kickoff team. He played on the scout team. He said he's just so unselfish. Personal foul. Face mask. 27 defense. 15-yard penalty. First down. Well, the face mask called against uh, Tyrone McKenzie. There's a guy who played at Iowa State, Michigan State. 305 career tackles coming in. Had over 100 last year. He's a good football player. You don't hear much about him. He's an aggressive football player, and you're right. He's an unsung hero on this defense, and he's always around the football. Came in with 71 total tackles, eight tackles for a loss. He's a guy that can make plays, and they're going to look to him in this second half to make big plays. 
I mentioned over 100. He had 121. I should mention that's a school record at USF. Here's Cordell Young. And Young. Drag down close to the 30 yard line. Lewis Gachette finally makes the stop for the Bulls. Another first down for Rutgers. Boy, nice job by that left side of the offensive line. Anthony Davis, Howard Barbary, and center Ryan Blazik. They do a great job of just creating some leverage here, and they create a crease. You can see the blocking, just a good job of surging outside, and they get George Selby going outside, and that's a good job by the big. The big uglies up front doing a great job of winning that battle at the line of scrimmage. Cordell Young, the uh, offensive player of the week. And the Big East picked up 18 on the play at 143. Today's first and 10 line brought to you by Overstock.com. Teal gets it off and he's nailed by guess who? Number 95 just as he released the football. George Selby did a great job, Mike, of coming from that short side. He just beats the offensive tackle. There's that speed rush, and he, they had some help set up for him. But the offensive guard never got out there, and Teal's lucky that this pass didn't get intercepted because there's a couple deflected passes earlier in the game that were picked off from either side. This time, Selby gets to the backfield in a hurry. We talked about that with you on Kajemi's corner. He's got some explosive speed coming off the edge. He anticipates that snap. Penalty markers down as Martinick gets the call again. Uh, Shiano doing a good job of mixing and matching the young with Martinick. You know, John, Rutgers in the first half, rushing 13 carries, 25 yards. They've got 26 on this drive alone. Offside. 95 defense. Five-yard penalty. There's that Second anticipation down. again. We huh? talked about anticipation, but Mike Teal must be doing a nice job of voice inflection and changing up his count because it looks like everybody's trying to anticipate that snap count. Teal held the count for maybe one second longer and got an easy five yards and you know could be George Selby down on that three-point stance. We talked about it at halftime. Looking at the hands widening out, Teal may be messing around yeah, a little bit maybe, with George. That's maybe, right. Maybe Teal was in the locker room watching Kajemi's corner. He said, all right, well, I'll get you. You know, who's not watching Kajemi's corner, right? <laughs> Martinek still running hard, trying to turn the corner. Keon Wilson, along with Lewis Gachette. A gain of four that time for Martinek. Mike Teal trying to get the tempo of this offense. Third and short, they're at the line of scrimmage. He swings it out, Tim Brown. Tim Brown out of bounds. Inside the 20-yard line, close to the 15. Score here from Rutgers would be huge, leading 21 to 10. They had 126 First yards of total Rutgers. offense in the first half. Yeah, it'd be enormous to come out and take that opening kickoff of the second half and punch it right in the end zone. You know Mike Teal, that's what's on his mind, and I'm sure head coach Greg Schiano was hammering that home at halftime. Listen, guys, we get the football back. We can take it. We can take the emotion, take the crowd out of this thing, try to take some of the pride and determination out of that defense for the Bulls. Well, Big Mo on their side right now. You can see their confidence is growing and growing. Keep it on the ground. Cordell Young down to the 15-yard line. Greg Schiano talking about George Selby this week. He said he's the kind of player that you just kind of stand there on the sidelines and hold your breath. Well, they've done a nice job on Selby this afternoon. Only one really big play that he's made on Mike Teal, and you have to credit that offensive line and the running backs doing a great job of locating George where he is on the edge and running away from him, and sometimes they've done a nice job of double-teaming and running right at him. It would be fun to be a good defensive player, but when they're running away from me 83% of the time, that would be frustrating. It's a little frustrating, you're right. They come out firing, and this one's uh, complete down inside. Tamar Graves, the tight end with the reception. Keon Wilson makes the stop. Gain of 13, first and goal now for Rutgers. And that's just too easy for Mike Teal. If you're looking at the Bulls' defense, really, Graves just runs down and stops about eight yards. The linebacker, Keon Wilson, can't get underneath the route. And that's just an easy throw and an easy catch inside the red zone. And this offense, fifth in the Big East in the red zone, they're trying to get a score here to knock the Bulls out. Seven catch in the air for Graves. Teal, Young. Wow, hits a wall and gets pushed back. Several Bulls. Get on the stop that time. 
It looked like Tyrone McKenzie was one of those guys you mentioned a couple plays ago, Mike, doing a nice job of wrapping up Cordell Young about the one yard line. Second and goal for the Scarlet Knights. Cordell Young goes off. He's been getting stronger and stronger. Of course, he missed those four games because of knee soreness. 143 last week. This is Martin. Puts his head down and gets in for the touchdown. Great second effort. John Jimmy, he was stopped at the line of scrimmage and just kept going forward. Yeah, he was stopped behind the line of scrimmage, and that's a great effort by Joe Martinick of getting in the end zone. He was met about the two-yard line. It's just going to be straight downhill right there at the point of attack and just fight through the arm tackle. That's just good toughness inside the five-yard line by Joe Martinick. Well, third-quarter numbers were 69-7, to and you'd mentioned that wasn't an offensive touchdown. First offensive point scored against the USF defense in the third quarter this year. San Santi adds one more. And Rutgers puts seven on the board. 28 to 10 now here in South Florida. Well, goal accomplished by the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. They come out and take that opening kickoff of the second half and do a great job of taking it down the field, running and throwing it, and getting it in the end zone. And we're taking a look at the football facilities at USF. And there's the pole inside the coaches' offices. They might uh, haul that pole down here because they could use some power right now as they're down. 28 to 10. Very impressive scoring drive by Rutgers. Boy, 12 plays, 82 yards, 516 off the clock. And Joe Martinick gets his first rushing touchdown this afternoon. He did a great job in the drive running the football. And it was a good mix of Mike Teal throwing the football downfield and in a nice mix of running the football as well. So Teddy Delagano, the kicker and the punter for Rutgers, getting ready to kick off to the Bulls once again. If they do get their bull berth, Delagano will have a big role in that, and I'll explain that right after the kick. It's taken at the 10-yard line. Bogan over the 40. Drops. Set him up the 47-yard line, a return of 38 yards by Don Tavia Bogan, the sophomore. Let's go back to that drive for Rutgers first. I mean, first half it was turnovers. That was just an impressive drive. It really was, and Mike Teal did a nice job going 82 yards, throwing the football to the outside, mixing in the running game of Joe Martinick. He had another nice run down the sideline by Cordell Young. Now, this rushing team in the first half, Rutgers only had 25 yards rushing in the first half. On that drive alone, they had 35 yards rushing, so they found what they wanted to get back to the running game but a good mix of Mike Teal as well. Boy Martinick uh, have to be impressed the way he runs. Runs hard. Trophy. It's complete. Rutgers territory. Jesse Hester once again. Gain of 11 that time. So Matt Grothy at some of the numbers there earlier in the season. Then, uh, as of late, first seven games, very impressive. Yeah, he was on fire in the last three games, seven interceptions and only two touchdowns. And today, he really rushed the football effectively, but no one else has been able to run the football for the Bulls and, and carry the load for him. There's Grothy going deep this time, and he overshoots his man. Looking for Patrick Richardson once again. Well, once again, uh, excuse me, that's Torres Johnson. His jersey was pulled up. Johnson now has been missed three times here today. That time, probably the most difficult of the three that he missed him on, trying to go over the top. That was good coverage and good job by the secondary for Rutgers. They had a guy over the top, and Joe LaFage, who did a nice job of staying at home and really preventing Grothy from making a big play for Jim Levitt's offense. Great shot of Jim Levitt. <laughs> Some frustration on the sidelines. Huge drive. The Bulls used to uh, dominating the third quarter. Grothy. Some escapability, but uh, there's big number 97. Pete Pedirdoff again. He's had a whale of a ball game. Well, this defense has done an excellent job. Anytime the Bulls have mounted any kind of drive and got a spark in their offense going, they've really shut the door in, in their territory. And Greg Schiano has to be proud of what they've done so far. Grothy. Fires. And it's caught. Helmet comes off, so there's some popping. There's Bogan with the reception. Dyer Kitchen with the hit. Game of 14 for the Bulls. 
It's a shame that uh, Bogan's helmet just came flying off on the hit from uh, Kitchen. Boy, what a catch by Dontavia Bogan. He went up to get the football. That ball was in the air a long time. Looks like he might be a little bit woozy. Yeah, I mean, he that ball hangs up there, and it looked like the tackler for Rutgers just went up in the, the, and got the helmet and really got him by the chin strap, and it turned the uh, the helmet right off of Bogan's head. But lucky he's not seriously hurt on that play. Here's Grothy. And he throws it at the feet of his running back, Williams. You go back to the last play, John. Not to open up a can of worms, but you cannot a horse collar. But, I mean, to me, that's as egregious. It's about the same thing. The defender wants to stop him. I understand that. But when you grab the kid's helmet like that, it's like a horse it collar. It should be a, a, an offset of the face mask or the horse yeah. collar. Because anytime you get a hand around the neck or the face area and that helmet comes off, you would think it should be 15 yards. Matt Grothy on this drive. Ran the football for the 481st time in his career. That's a record. He's only a junior. That's a lot of carries for a QB. Brophy wants to come up throwing. Does. And it's Hester. Older progress. Should mark this at the 20 yard line. Gain of seven more. Kevin Malice, the linebacker, making the stop. Sometimes when you're not as accurate as you would like to be, those plays become more difficult. And Matt Grothy today on a couple of occasions to the short side, Mike, if he could hit Jesse Hester where he doesn't have to work so hard for the easy catch, he might be able to get that football and turn up for a couple extra yards to get him out of these third and short situations. Hester now with six catches for 72 yards, came in with 37. Big third down play, third and three at the 19. Grothy. As his man, it's Hester again. When in doubt, go to the guy that you know is going to catch the football. Well, he has such confidence in Hester and his route running ability and the, the knack of the timing of when to throw the football when he breaks open. That's a good job by Matt Grothy going back to Jesse Hester. Threw the football perfectly, and it timed up well to the short side. He's yes. been running that quarterback draw in this situation now, too, Mike. Ben Williams gets down to the 10-yard line before he's tripped up. And Ryan D'Imperio, the middle linebacker, grabbing a shoestring tackle. Got the whole shoe. Maybe a lineman down as well for the Bulls. Gain of three. Second and seven. Like Jacob Sims. And Sims, the sophomore out of uh, Winter Park. Even though only a sophomore, one of the... Uh, Mainstays, one of the key players on that offensive front, which yeah. has been juggled a little bit as of late, too. It really has. Mark Dial went from right tackle to left tackle. Ryan Schmidt went from left tackle to right guard. And Jacob Sims moved into that right tackle spot. It looked like they're looking at that right ankle or right lower leg. So Jacob Sims, the 6'5", 285-pound sophomore, limps off. Joe Herzhauser. Another sophomore uh, should replace him in the offensive line as Jim Levitt needs a touchdown here with uh, just 7.15 to go in the third quarter. Oh, absolutely. They need to answer and they need to answer with six points in that extra point. And they have to come back, go three plays and out, try to get another scoring opportunity for this offense because being down 28-10 with 7-10 remaining in the third quarter. Both are looking back at the bench. I think that Rutgers defense exposed themselves. Going for the fade. Johnson finally has one. Touchdown, Bulls. Johnson, that's his fifth touchdown this year. He's had a frustrating afternoon. This one goes for 10 yards. Yeah, this time Matt Grothy and Taurus Johnson hook up. That was a perfect throw by Matt Grothy. Just a little inside wheel route to Taurus Johnson. Perfect timing. The Rutgers defense was beating Matt Grothy, trying to make him feel like they were going to come with pressure. They don't. Plenty of time, good protection, and an accurate throw by Matt Grothy. Grothy now. 44 career touchdowns, and that's not going to help. This could go for the extra point the other way, but it doesn't. Uh, but that doesn't help the Bulls at all as they finally 
jump on the free football there at about the 23 yard line but the uh, the big story there is they miss a point and, and at this point they need every point they can so instead of a 28 to 17 it's 28 to 16 right now and Johnson pulls in his 11th a career touchdown that's just three off the school record and Matt Grothy now 66 career touchdowns either passing or rushing Sunny blue skies in Tampa, Florida this afternoon. South Florida takes on Rutgers inside Raymond James Stadium, the Big East game of the week, along with John Conjemi, Quinn Kestnick, I'm Mike Gleason. Great to have you with us. Rutgers looking for their fourth straight win, and the Bulls trying to avoid their third straight setback. And Torres Johnson just pulled in his 11th career touchdown pass, and it's been a long afternoon for him, and uh, that alleviates some of the frustration. It really does. He's been wide open on numerous occasions, and Matt Grothy's not been able to get him the football, but that time a perfect strike by Matt Grothy in the back of the end zone. Underwood McCourty, the deep man for Rutgers now, holding on to the 28-16 lead, and Underwood lets it hit, and it will start from the 20-yard line. Grothy did an excellent job, Mike, on that last touchdown of really not getting baited into the would-be blitz. Rutgers trying to bait him into the blitz. This is going to be an inside route that's going to bring the cornerback up, and then it's just an inside wheel route to the back of the end zone. Grothy perfect on the throw. Good timing. He gets it in the shotgun and throws a strike, but then on the ensuing play, you see the high snap goes right through the holder, Greg, Grant Gregory's hands, and you know, at this point in the game, you need every point you can get. <laughs> Was that a high snap, or Gregory would love to have it? Well, he'd like to have another <laughs> chance at it. He's a quarterback, so I'm going to say it's a little bit of a high snap. Right. Deal, 12 of 20, 129 yards. Touchdown, two picks. Comes out, throwing the football, looking for Britt, and he throws it out of bounds at the 35. Well, Mike, the Bulls defense, they can change the complexion of this game right now. If they can go three plays and out, get the football back, you can get a little bit more excitement in this crowd, a little bit more momentum on your sideline. But if Rutgers goes ahead and takes it down and sticks it down their throat again, just like they did the opening series of the second half, you know, Wally Burnham's going to have a tough time getting rallying his defense back. So, in other words, big drive for Rutgers right here. Second and ten. Martinick. Some popping of the pads there as McKenzie brings, brings him down. Nice open field tackle, Mike, by Tyrone McKenzie. You mentioned it in the first half. This is a guy that's really unsung for this defensive uh, linebacking crew that's been decimated with injuries. He's the only guy that's been able to stay healthy this year. And Jim Lovett likes to uh, change his captains. This young man's been a captain seven times in nine games this year. Obviously, the coaching staff, his fellow teammates, think the world of him. Teal, plenty of time, looking, finding his man at the 35. And it's Tim Brown. Louis Cachette on the coverage that time for USF, and Tim Brown pulls in another catch. Boy, big-time catch, climbing the ladder on the wide side of the field. Teal lets this thing rip to the wide side to touch high. But the small 5'8", 165 pound wide receiver from Miami, Florida, the junior goes up and gets a big third down conversion. Three for 39 now on Brown. Nice job of holding onto the ball because uh, Bichette delivered the big hit. Here's Britt again. This is the third time he's carried the football. Tries to turn it up and gets up over the line of scrimmage. And a penalty flag dropped at about the 36. Jerome Murphy coming up to make the stick. Personal foul. Personal foul. Tripping. Tripping. 61 offense. 15-yard penalty. First down. That's Ryan Blazek, the starting center, Richard Jr., with the infraction. You talk about uh, teams moving guys around, too. Blazek, uh, the only lineman to start every game at the same position this year. Yeah, both of these teams like to move their offensive linemen around to get that right combination. And... He's been the rock, the center of that offensive line. So, Greg Giano, you mentioned uh, an important drive. Uh, they were moving it, so now they're pushed back. The ball inside the 20-yard line again. Well, even if you don't score, if you're Greg Schiano and you're on offense for Rutgers, even if you don't get points, you'd like to win the battle of the field position. Make Matt Grothy and the Bulls drive 80 yards for a score. And they would love to eat some clock, huh? Absolutely. 80 yards. 
So Greg Gregory, the offensive coordinator, telling us yesterday that, uh, you know, with these 80-yard drives, you don't have high-scoring games. And uh, the South Florida Bulls are really a quick-score offense. But, boy, Rutgers would love to eat some time now. As you see, 5.23 to go in the third quarter. A quarter usually dominated by USF. And Greg Schiano, as we've mentioned time and time again today, never gave up on this football team. Always thought they were close. And you always agree with them, too. And they finally turned the corner looking for their fourth straight today. Another completion for Teal. And it's Britt once again. And George Shelby makes a stop. A gain of 10. When you look at the Big East standings, so once again, Cincinnati 4-1. We heard from Brian Kelly earlier in the broadcast. Pittsburgh and West Virginia are idle. Look at Rutgers. 1-5 start. Mathematically, they're not out of this race. Yet. I know. As funny as it sounds, because we covered Rutgers a few times earlier in this, this season, and they struggled early, but... Right now, if they can continue on this winning streak, they can be right in the mix. Teal. Buy some time by rolling out of the pocket. I think his arm was hit as the ball was released. Pretty decent coverage by the Bulls downfield. And Teal will face a third down situation. Yeah, you call that a coverage sack. That was a nice job by Lewis Gachette and Carlton Williams. They had the would-be receiver, Underwood, to the wide side where Mike was trying to roll and get him the football well covered. And that was a good job by Teal just to get rid of it and throw it out of bounds on the afternoon. 14 of 24 for 153 yards in that touchdown. Six of nine on third downs. Teal averaging 222 passing the game. Nice job escaping the rush, and he swings it out, and it's complete to his big tight end. Kevin Brock with the catch, and Carlton Williams drags him down, a gain of 10 more, but it's going to bring up a kicking situation. But that's a great job by Mike Teal in this offense. After that penalty, the tripping penalty, that ball was back at the 21-yard line. They get it close to the 41-yard line, so they do win some field position, and with a good punt, they'll make it tough on Grothy and company offensively. John, let me finish that story there about Teddy Delagana against UConn. It was a 12-10 win. He pinned the Huskies inside the 10 four times in the second half. Successive punts at the one, three, and two yard line. So if, that was my point, if they get bowl eligible, he will play an important role because that winning streak all started with the win over UConn. There's a fumble. Another turnover. Rutgers football, but there is a penalty flag down. Forty-nine yard punt. Legal formation on the punt team. Five yard penalty. What a break. What a break for Jim Levitt, the South Florida Bulls. That is a huge break with only 334 to go in the third quarter. Delagana hit a great punt there for Greg Ciano and their special teams, and they get they caused the turnover, but it's all going to come back and have to kick it again. That was Theo Wilson on the return. Former defensive back, left a uh, talented secondary, came over and joined a crowded wide receiver core. The six foot, 207 pound junior goes back again inside his 25, and I'm sure he is breathing the biggest sigh of relief in the stadium right now. Yeah, he gets another opportunity. And that's all you can wish for after you lay one down on the carpet. Delegana has 10 punts of at least 50 yards in his last four games. Along of 61 at UConn. Delegana punting. The 25. They're telling Theo Wilson, stay away from it. Hits. And it's going to be down at about the 23-yard line. 41-yard punt that time, and Theo Wilson was hoping to redeem himself, but he was told to stay away. We're going to take a time out here from Raymond James Stadium. There it is, 324 to go, 28-16, Rutgers. Back in Tampa, 324 to go, still in the third quarter, 28-16. Bulls trying to rally. They have the football at about the 24-yard line.
Grothy looking and finding a wide open receiver. Dontavia Bogan on the reception once again. Jason McCordy finally caught up. Let's go downstairs with Quinn. Mike, the sun continues to beat down. This week, Rutgers choosing to practice indoors. They turn the heat up to 85 degrees. We'll find out if it pays off here late third quarter and fourth quarter. After every possession, these guys have come over to the bench. They've sat under these rain rooms, these mist makers, a lot of electrolytes, a lot of water, and, and some. they got some gi giant sponges that a lot of the players have been uh, dunking in ice and putting over the back of their heads after every possession. Quint, I know you're not out there hitting people, but how hot is it down there? It's, it's pretty hot for a northerner like myself. There's another fumble, Jesse Hester. Usually Mr. Consistency, stripped of the ball, and Rutgers has it. Jason McCourty, David Rowe, came in and knocked the ball loose. That's exactly what happened right from behind Jesse Hester, the right hand of David Rowe comes in. It's gonna be a good play over the middle. Good completion by Matt Grothy. Hester trying to make a bigger play. Loses his balance and exposes the football. A nice big hit from behind by David Rowe. And McCourtney gets on the football and it really takes the momentum away from this offense and gives it right back to the defense. That's the fourth turnover today. The Scarlet Knight defense is forced. And in four wins, they have eight turnovers on the season. And John David Rowe, a true freshman from Cocoa, Florida. They're going to review it upstairs. As Noel Turner, the replay official, it was we'll hard. Take a look at the second play. Mike, it was hard to tell if Jesse Hester's knee was down. It looked like he was trying to regain his balance. But from the initial hit, it looked like a good play. Let's take another look at Matt Grothy. He had good protection, just throws an easy pass over the middle. And you're going to see Hester go back. To the right side, loses his balance. Ooh, it's pretty loose, huh? Yeah, it's a clean hit. There was no question about that call. That's a fumble. Did a nice job of uh, having a D'Imperio slide off of him, or it was Malice sliding off of him, and the ball was at that point being carried like a loaf of bread. Yeah, it looked like Jesse Hester was trying to go and protect the football in the moment to try to bring it back in. It was exposed, and a great job by David Rowe punching out the football. Got to be tough for Jim Levin. After review, the rolling on the field is confirmed. The ball came out before the runner was down. First down, Rutgers. Get back to number four, David Rowe, a true freshman from Cocoa, Florida. John, he was not even listed on the two deep, and that's the second big play he's had today. Yeah, he has. He's really been a thorn in the side of the Bulls and Jim Levitt and, and Hester on the sidelines because Matt Grothy had great field position. Nice play on first down. They're moving the chains. They're getting it close to the 50-yard line. And then they turn it over again, and Greg Schiano's offense back on the field. They've had great success with that opening drive in the second half, and now they have great field position again. Inside three minutes to the third quarter. Again, we go back and relive the fact that the Bulls have outscored the opposition 69 to 7 in the third. Penalty flag down again as Martinek pounds his way down to the 40 yard line. Bichette making the stop, a gain of 12 more. Flag on the play. Offside, defense, penalties decline. First down. Well, I've been impressed with Joe Martinick. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's running the football downhill, and it's like a changeup. After you see Cordell Young for the first half, Joe Martinick comes in, and he runs right at you. Not going to fool you with a lot of moves. He's going to go downhill, north and south, and he's got good speed. I said to Larry Zonka earlier in this stadium, I should have said Mike Allstott, I guess. Huh? That's right. <laughs> Ten carries now for Martinick for 47 yards and a touchdown. There he is again, spinning, still on his feet. Down to the 35-yard line. Got to drag him down. Gachette making the stop again. Yeah, the miscues have been obvious, and it's been really throwing the rhythm off for the Bulls today. They've been moving the football, but a missed field goal after getting great field position or a tip pass that turns into an interception, or even worse, an interception for a touchdown. You get a field goal block at the end of the half. You have a miscue on the, on the snap on the extra point. You get a fumble from behind. This defense for Rutgers is doing an excellent job of causing 
Matt Grothy to throw the football when he doesn't want to, but even better, just getting the turnovers for scores and touchdowns. And Grothy, two picks today, fumbled twice in Rutgers territory, missed two field goals. They missed the extra point. So it's been a culmination of things, not only on offense, Mike, but special teams as well. Yeah, the Bulls came in minus one as far as turnovers, which isn't bad considering that West Virginia and Syracuse are the only teams in positive territory. West Virginia at plus five, Syracuse at plus three. But boy, you get a team like Rutgers coming in, uh, as Wally Burnham said, Teal is uh, hot as a firecracker and three straight wins. You don't want to start turning the football over once or twice, but four times, it's hard to win turning over four times. Yeah, and especially now as the rain, the light rain starts to fall here at Raymond James Stadium. You know, the ball, the Bulls are having trouble enough offensively holding on to it. So now the job for Rutgers is to really stay patient on offense. A minute 43 left to go in the third quarter. A lot of game left. So they want to try to score with this great field position they have. Well, Greg Schiano turning up the heat in the bubble to 85 degrees. It looks like it's uh, paid off up to this juncture. How was it, though? You played a lot of college football in Pittsburgh when you came south. At what juncture does the heat start to get to you? As Fourth soon as you court? get off the plane. <laughs> you know, those big guys sometimes, as soon as you get off the plane, unless you're in great shape, it'll hurt you. Rutgers looks like they're handling it quite well. Markren, a fullback in motion to the top of your screen. Martinick. Good balance for the big guy. He's rolled back, shy of the 30. The shed on the tackle once again. You know, John, it's interesting. To know that Young is coming off a 143-yard game, and you brought up a good point that they're, they're mixing and matching the running backs so well, but I would have expected to see Young a lot more. Here you, you thought you would have, but, you know, Joe Martinick's running the football so effectively, you don't want to change it up. He's got a good rhythm going in the running game. He's got good timing on when he's hitting the holes, and he's not losing you any, any yardage. He's no, no negative plays with Joe Martinick in the football game. High school, 7,500 yards, 80 touchdowns in New Jersey. Wow. There he is again, moving the change. That's a first down. Bichette coming up to make the stop again. Gain of four that time for Rutgers. And they continue to move the chains. And the seconds continue to run off the clock inside a minute in the third quarter. Greg Ciano happy to take his time with great field position. The ball inside the 30-yard line. And that clock winding down underneath 50 seconds. Rutgers 7-11 on third down conversions today. They've done a nice job moving the chains when they've had the opportunity. Now they get first and 10 at the 28-yard line. That's impressive for only 36% on third down of the year. Play action, Teal buys some time. And the big tight end has his first touchdown of the season. Shamar Graves all alone. This one goes for 28. Nice play called by offensive coordinator John McNulty. And when you have inexperience at the linebacker position and you get into a running set, all the eyes are in the backfield when they should be on your keys. And one of those keys should be on the tight end. Right here, you've got to be man to man on the tight end. Everybody runs right by him. And that allows Shamar Graves to really walk into the end zone untouched. San Santi with the kick. And the hill, the Bulls have to climb now as we approach the fourth quarter, becomes steeper and steeper. The score of Rutgers 35, USF 16. And now, in the back of their mind, knowing that they have dominated this entire 2008 season in the third quarter, they're back on their heels. Oh, absolutely. Graves just going to come out and run a corner route. And this is the easiest pass Mike Teal's thrown all day. All you had to do was get it out in front of him. You can see the linebackers trailing Graves the entire time. They bit on the play fake, and that, that enabled Mike Teal to have enough time. All he had to do is put some air underneath the football, and this Rutgers team can feel it. You said they bit on the play fake. It was funny because after the play fake, I was surprised that uh, Graves was so wide open because it wasn't his best play action pass of the day. Yeah, it didn't have to be because he was so wide open. The linebackers <laughs> bit so hard that they ran into the backfield, or at least to the line of scrimmage, and made it easier for Mike Teal. So Mike Teal came into the game 518 yards shy of passing Ryan Hart, who had 8,482 yards. Top the list at Rutgers, and uh, Hart is the quarterback that Teal replaced a few years ago when you were calling Big East games. And some people were calling for uh, Teal's head this year. Well, he hung in there. 
hung with him, too. He really did. He did a great job of keeping his composure all year, and that's what you get when you have a senior quarterback that's been through a lot, and, and Mike has been through a lot in his career, a lot more good than bad, but he struggled early, and he was the first guy to know it, and now he's got a smile on his face, and he's coming back and playing very well for Greg Schiano. 35 to 16, 26 seconds to go in quarter number three. Delagana with a short kick and it goes out of bounds. That's the second time we've seen that penalty marker come up on kickoffs. Kick out of bounds. Kick out of bounds. The ball we put on the 40 yard line. First down. So the Big East uh, game of the week on the Big East Network continues next Saturday, November 22nd. Stan Brock's Black Knights of Army head into Piscataway to take on the Scarlet Knights. Now, Army will rely on the power for running a fullback, uh, Colin Mooney, to carry the load on the road. Rutgers will look to uh, Mike Teal to continue his hot streak to lead the Scarlet Knights to their another victory, their fourth straight at Rutgers Stadium. The Big East game of the week. Army and Rutgers next Saturday, November 22nd at noon Eastern only on the Big East Network. Here's Grothy, comes out firing. Completes. Boy, running on a purpose that time. Another penalty marker down. And it's Johnson already with one touchdown reception. He wanted his second. Boy, he was going. Yeah, I think they're going to get called for a holding or a block in the back in that diamond. Holding. 30 offense. 10 yard penalty in the spot of the foul. First down. Well, the hill is steep, and Jim Levitt's balls continue to shoot themselves in the foot. Boy, positive play of over 20 yards. Just a hitch screen out to the right side, the wide side. They had four receivers there. You can see 35 points mm. today by Rutgers, the most that the Bulls have allowed all season. They shoot themselves in the foot, as you said, Mike, a positive play that comes back. They come in averaging, uh, giving up 19 points a game. It's number two in the Big East behind West Virginia. Only 282 yards of offense. That's number one in the Big East. And right now, trailing a large amount. This one's deflected at the line of scrimmage. It is complete. But again, uh, those Rutgers guys up front have been very active. And they've got their arms up. Jesse Hester. And there's number 97 again, Pete Figurda. So that's the final play of the third quarter. Greg Schiano and his Scarlet Knights of Rutgers heading for the final 15 minutes. And they lead at 35-16. Looks like a sim. game of the week. First play of the fourth quarter coming up for the Bulls and their fans want some points. They average 30. They have 16 against this tough Rutgers defense and uh, case in point right there. Grothy can barely get the pass off. Boy, big hit. Huge hit on the inside. Dave Silvestro, the sophomore out of New Jersey. South Florida and Rutgers. Raymond James Stadium, the Big East game of the week, along with uh, John Congemi and Quinn Kesnick. Mike Leeson here. Great to have you with us. And a ton at stake for both schools. Rutgers looking for their fourth straight win. And USF, now well, they're trying to avoid a three-game skid, but their work is cut out for them now. As Grothy and company need some instant points. Instant offense, penalty flag down, completed pass, but the flag dropped back at about the 28 yard line. Holding. Holding. 65 offense. 10 yard penalty. Third down. Another shot in the foot. Boy, it seems like every time they make a big play, Mike, it comes back for a holding or a or a block in the back or, or a tip pass or, or, a, or a guy coming in and stripping the football and turning it over for Rutgers. They just really hurt themselves and Jim Levitt doesn't have an answer because they're positive plays but one guy is holding them back each play and you have to have all 11 guys on the same page. That time the guilty party Ryan Schmidt the senior out of Boca seven penalties for 15 for 65 rather this one's complete and once again, Benjamin Williams on the receiving end. A defensive end, George Johnson, getting downfield to make the play. Tackle on the play by number 36, Courtney Green. 
Courtney Green on the stop as well. The uh, free safety making his 48th consecutive start. Gain of six that time for the Bulls. Well, now it's on their special teams in defense. Fourth and, and medium. They have to kick and pin the Rutgers special teams back inside the 10-yard line, hopefully, and let their defense see if they can stop Mike Teal and company. Yeah, Rutgers doing a good job of moving the chains, too, and eating up that clock in the third quarter. Alvarado's kick is a high one. It's been taken by Campbell. Fair catch at the five-yard line. 51-yard punt, so 95 yards away. But again, the most important right now is eat some clocks for the Scarlet Knights. Yeah, I think Greg Shano wants to let him know not to fair catch that. And, Mike, we take a look at, at the Big East standings. I mean, Cincinnati in the driver's seat after that victory last night on the road at Louisville. But Rutgers, the Scarlet Knights, after that start of 1-5, and five, finding their way up the leaderboard and trying to get into the Big East mix. Today's first and ten line is brought to you by Overstock.com. Exactly what you said, John. Uh, in league play, they lead in five statistical categories. Martinick trying to bounce to the outside. Yeah. Right down by Jerome Murphy, the cornerback. So this is a completely different ball club leading in five statistical categories than the two teams that we saw earlier this year. Yeah, the, the two games that we saw earlier was a lot of turnovers, a lot of missed opportunities, maybe a little out of rhythm offensively. thought defensively Greg Schiano's team played pretty well throughout the season, and it shows in the numbers. They were first against the pass coming in today. They were third in the red zone defense. They've done a nice job defensively, but the turnovers have really held this team back. They haven't made so many you know, in the past three or four weeks, but if they did, they overcame them. And the one and five start, you hate to be uh, redundant, but uh, the fact that there was no finger pointing as Teal goes down the middle, looking for Britt, has him, he's on his feet. 40, 20, 10, touchdown, Kenny Britt. 95 yards. And that'll get you off your seat if you're wearing red. I tell you that. <laughs> if you're wearing red. Greg you're... Ciano had that play called and offensive coordinator John McNulty earlier in the game in the first half. It was a big play down there. And this is the Liberty Mutual play of the game. What a great throw. A strong throw. Great protection in the pocket. He bounces off of Jerome Murphy, the would-be tackler. Then Kenny Britt has enough in the tank to take it the distance. San Santee drills it through. Britt, seven catches, 163 yards, and one touchdown. I remember the game we did at West Virginia. They had 14 completions, 12 went to Kenny Britt. That great size, had the speed to pull away from that secondary. Let's take another look, John, at the touchdown. Just an awesome play. Teal comes back, lets it rip, and Kenny Britt does the rest. Six points for Rutgers. Forty-two sixteen, and uh, John uh, Mike Teal obviously saw something out there. Yeah, it was it was man coverage all the way, and you're going to see here it's man coverage here. I've got him, I've got him. So there's nobody in the middle of the field this way. Kenny Britt knows that. All he has to do is beat the outside leverage, and Mike Teal throws a perfect pass. It leads him to the middle. He breaks one tackle, and it's it's a terrific play. Ninety-three yards, second longest in school history by Kenny Britt off the arm of Mike Teal. And Kenny Britt, I mean, nobody's talking about this kid nationally. This guy's having yeah. a phenomenal season, and he's really taken Rutgers on their shoulders and carried them when they struggled all year. That's his 12th career 100-yard game as he continues to uh, climb the Big East list. And the Bulls return it back in near the 30-yard uh, line. There's six of those 100-yard games this year. You know... You mentioned uh, that's a great graphic right here. What you just said. Nobody's talking about uh, Kenny Britt. Look at the numbers compared to Crabtree. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Kenny Britt deserves to be in any spotlight that's talking about national wide receivers because this guy, all he does is is make plays and make touchdowns and gain yards for this offense. And the only reason you don't hear him is because Rutgers is four and five. Grothy, I want to say playing catch up, but Dean Perio drags him down. Another sack for Rutgers. 
Let's go back to Kenny Britt for a second now. Yeah, going back in, in the struggles that Kenny Britt faces is his team is four and five. You know, if you're Michael Crabtree and you're you're on the road and, and you're rolling and you're second in the country, you know, you're behind Alabama and you're beating Texas, you have national exposure. This guy is having one heck of a season, and he's doing it really, and nobody knows about it except if you're watching Big East football. Rothy comes down, finds his man, it's complete. This one goes to Patrick Richardson. Now, Fritz with 12 100 yard games. Antonio Bryant at 13, Larry Fitzgerald 14. And if they get full eligible, they still have three games after this one. So, do it, whether yeah. if he uh, comes back or not for a senior year, he can do it. But the fact that Fitzgerald had 14 in two years at Pitt is <laughs> phenomenal. Phenomenal. After this play, uh, I have a correction to make as far as that touchdown with Kenny Britt. I said it was 95 yards as Grothy. Finds his man once again. It's Hester over the 45. Hester spins, dropped to the 48. It was actually 93 yards, John. The, the second longest in Rutgers history. 95. He got to go back to 1977. Bert Kosa against Temple at a 95-yard touchdown. He still holds the record. Can't speak for uh, Kenny Britt, who uh, sat out the suspended game along with uh, Davis earlier this year, and they said that he's really refocused. After sitting on the sidelines watching the game, if you remember, there's another sack. So there's two sacks on this drive, but D'Imperio, that's his second on this series. D'Imperio's had a nice game for Greg Schiano, calling the defensive signals for Rutgers today. They've really been flying around to the football and made it difficult for Matt Grothy to be consistent. We talked about it in the open. Matt Grothy was going to have to have one of his best games of the year, but the 11 in red making it difficult for him today. 10-47 and counting, 42-16. This one's complete, and the penalty flag dropped. This one goes to A.J. Love, his second catch, and once again, you saw the frustration. 65 off. Coming back. 10-yard penalty, second down. It's a third hold. Tom Tomzak, the official. We need a good drink of water after the game, after all the uh, penalties. Ice the elbow down as well. <laughs> so once again at 65, that's Ryan Schmidt. He's had back-to-back -back penalties, and Jim Levitt now, with all the energy that he has and the passion, he's got to be he's fit to be tied. mentioned that uh, it's no easy task now for the Bulls even if they had won this football game they still have a game with UConn and oh West absolutely Virginia. it was an uphill battle for the Bulls all the way and it was going to be difficult today because of the emotion that they're going to have to overcome and Rutgers having a lot of confidence in South Florida you can see the dejection on the sidelines and the mistakes that they've been making and it really shows in Jim Levitt as well because they prepared they thought they had a great week of practice this week they thought the tempo was up they thought the defense was flying around and talking with you know Greg Gregory and Wally Burnham both coordinators felt like they had great weeks of practice and just didn't happen on Saturday another reception for Benjamin Williams and he's inside Rutgers territory once again 44 Ryan D'Imperio along with uh, Courtney Green and Joel LaFresh on the play as well, so Rutgers flying around defensively. And South Florida now facing a fourth down, Mike. They're going to have to go for it with under 10 minutes remaining. And it's fourth and five. And Rutgers is going to call a timeout to talk things uh, over. They'll have one left, but again with a 42-16 lead. I don't want to say too much. I keep going back to that Cincinnati and West Virginia game. I watched it on tape. There's what two, two and a half minutes to go, and they were down 20 to seven. You never would have believed. Can't believe. it. Yeah. Everybody had left the stadium and uh, forced overtime, and of course the Bearcats prevailed in overtime. And Matt Grothy is going to be sore tomorrow because he's taking a lot of shots in the pocket. And he ran the football very effectively early in the game, but no one else really could 
pick up the slack, running the football, throwing the football, wasn't bad at all today. 27 of 40 for 278, one touchdown, and he had the two picks. A couple of them were tip passes and really couldn't do anything about. And, you know, that's really been the thing that's happened the last couple of weeks out after the off week. He had a couple of passes that were tipped two weeks ago to turn into interceptions, and they take points off the board. You know, John, you saw the Rutgers sideline. They lived off of the uh, turnovers in the first half, but uh, Teal and company, the offensively, they put together good, strong drive. And time now for our Polaris AT, the toughest player of the game, and Ryan D'Imperio had a whale of a game at middle linebacker for the Scarlet Knights. Three sacks this afternoon. batted up and it's completed to Patrick Richardson. A.J. Love was the intended receiver. That's probably the first break they've had all the second Man, half. everybody's shaking their heads probably. How about one for us this time, right? Richardson in the right spot at the right time for the Bulls because that could have been an interception as well. You know, in the first half, we talked about the Rutgers defense had looked pretty good all season long as the offense. But with the offense playing so well, you see an extra step in this defense for Rutgers as well. They were playing well, but they're playing lights out right now. Anytime, I, I believe, anytime you can win football games and you get on a little bit of a roll, I think everybody picks it up. You know, it doesn't matter if you're a backup linebacker, if you're a guy who just plays on special teams. If somebody gives a spark, it's only going to be infectious to the guy next to you. And I think that's what Rutgers has done offensively, defensively, and special teams. Everybody's picked it up a notch, and they've led their coach, you know, they followed their coaching staff because they never doubted them. Another heavy rush, and this one's up for grabs, and it's another INT. Jason McCourty has a pick six, and that's his second interception of the game and the second of his career, and the fifth turnover by the Bulls. Boy, this offensive line for the Bulls have really let Matt Grothy down late in the, se in the second half. A lot of guys coming free, and you can see Matt limping off the sidelines, and Mark Dial and company does, didn't do their job. A lot of guys coming free. A lot of guys beating him off the edge. You can see on the outside, Warren just whiffs at the right tackle, and it becomes a long day for number eight, Warren Green. Inside 10 minutes, 9.16 to go now. 42 to 16, Jim Levitt knows that Greg Schiano and Mike Teal will try to eat some clock here. Although I said that last time, and they just scored on a 93-yard touchdown. I think you'll be right this time. <laughs> okay. Under center, play action. Teal comes out throwing, and he was looking deep. And he throws it out of bounds. Wow, they were looking for Dennis Campbell streaking down the middle on a post pattern. Teal's pass is but the other quarterback, Matt Grothy, there's his numbers, 43 attempts, 28 completions, 292, but those three INTs just glare. Yeah, and it really hurt because a lot of them weren't his fault. A lot of tip passes, a lot of times he was being hit as he delivered the football. And on the other side, you know, Mike Teal's done an excellent job in the second half, 8 of 13 for 183, two touchdowns, and he did not turn the football over. That's the difference in the second half. He had two picks in the first half. They took that football in the opening possession of the uh, third quarter. The quarter usually dominated by the Bulls. Oh, good point, Mike. Rammed it down for a touchdown. Not sure how long that drive, 80 yards, 75 yard drive, I think it was. And again, you go back to the schedule for USF. They were hoping for a 10 and 3 finish, getting to a bowl. They're going to have their hands full to get to a bowl now. Well, you know, they come into the game 6 and 3. They've got Connecticut, and then they go at West Virginia. No layups. You know, Connecticut here on November 23rd, and then at West Virginia on the 6th on a, probably a, a blustery cold afternoon. So. And if somebody at home, John, said, well, wait a minute, uh, he just said it's going to be tough to become bowl. They're bowl eligible with six wins. But, but last year, sure, you know, yeah. yeah, to get into a bowl where you want to go, you have to need to get that seventh victory. Because uh, I believe Louisville was shut out last year, yeah. six and six. Six and six, yeah. Teal still throwing the football. And still looking for number 88, Kenny Britt. The number 88 still hauling him in. Well, that's a combination that's been very successful this afternoon. And... Greg Schiano and company keep dialing up Teal to Britt. Next time it'll move the chains again for a first down. Kenny Britt career-wise averaging 16 and a half yards a catch. 
He's over 62 catches now, and last year, single season record was 62 grabs for 1232. Eight for 173 and a touchdown here this afternoon. Yeah, that's just unbelievable. What an afternoon. Eight receptions for 173 yards and a touchdown. Six yards away from 1,000 now for Kenny Britt. And again, we go back to last year, 12-32. Penalty flag down. Dead ball. Personal foul. Unnecessary roughness. On the defense. 15-yard penalty. First down. To number 95, George Selvey. Maybe some frustration out there. Selvey comes off the field now. And Craig Marshall, the backup, goes back up. Let's take a look at our Polaris Ranger hardest working player of the game, John. Yeah, 16 rushes for 63 yards and a touchdown. Joe Martinick that had an excellent afternoon last week against Syracuse, had the big run. Today, more of the same. Nice running in between the tackles. Used his speed to the outside when he had to, but he's done a nice job. You can see a lot of guys patting him on the back and on the helmet. Always positive running. You know, that's what you like to see with these backs. And Joe Martinick didn't have any runs today for negative yards. Last week on the direct snap, he went 45 yards for a touchdown, and uh, somebody asked Greg Schiano, you know, if he could have taken him off the kickoff team, and he said, I could have, but he said he wanted to go back on the field, and he made the tackle on the kickoff. Greg Marshall making the tackle that time on Young. Young, a redshirt sophomore. They have Jordan Brooks, a redshirt freshman. Bartnick, Martnick is a freshman. But they lost Ray Rice, but they've got... They've got a couple guys that have... You know, done a nice job this year, and really from the middle of the season on, they really hit their stride, and I think that's where Greg Schiano really envisioned this team coming out and playing well early, but it took them a while. It took them a lot longer than their fans and, and really their team expected. And now, you know, in the middle of the season, they've done so well, and they're continuing to ride that wave and hopefully close it out with a couple more victories. There's Martinek cutting back, finding some uh, running room inside the 30-yard line, just shy of another first down. You mentioned all those backs. Young Brooks Martinek didn't mention Mason Robinson. So they've got a stable of running backs. I mean, you hate to lose a 2,000-yard rusher, Ray Rice. And if Ray now playing starting for the... Uh, Ravens had a 154-yard game recently against Cleveland, I believe. And if he's watching the broadcast, uh, I should put out that Teal, even when he was struggling, took the offensive line out for dinner this year. It's an annual thing. And uh, one of the offensive linemen said, you know what, Ray Rice always said he was going to come back and do that. He hasn't, he hasn't, hasn't come yet. back yet to uh, bring these, take these guys out. Don't hold your breath, huh, offensive line? <laughs> yeah, Martinick, what a move. Ten. Gachette. Drags him down inside the five-yard line. Martinick, out of New Jersey, said, you know what? I, w I don't mind playing fullback. Yeah, I wanted to play tailback, but I wanted to, you know, but watching what they did with Brian Leonard, who now plays in the NFL for St. Louis, he said, you know, I'll play fullback, but he can go either way. This guy runs so hard. He's got enough speed, to, you know, and enough burst to play tailback, and he's got enough toughness, and catches the football well to play either position. So, you know, it's, it's a bonus for John McNulty, their offensive coordinator, and Greg Schiano to, to put him in either with a Jordan Brooks or a Cordell Young. It doesn't really matter. And on the afternoon, 18 carries for 95 yards and had that touchdown. And they give it to him again. He's got to crack that century mark. Or hoping to anyway. And I'll tell you this, if these guys become bowl eligible, they would wind up running the table and go to seven and five. I think they're trying to send a message to some of the bowl representatives here. Up 42 to 16, and uh, you still can't stop it. They're trying to make a statement because they, they want to think that the first couple of weeks when they came out and didn't play well, you know, that wasn't the true sign of what Rutgers and Greg Schiano is all about. And I think they're trying to turn the corner now and, and do a much better job of it in, in being more consistent playing football. When you look at the uh, schedule that they played as far as the opposition's win-loss record, they have the toughest schedule in the Big East, according to an NCAA report. 
And again, we go back to the turnovers, John, in the first half. In the second half, even Martinek himself hit a huge second half. Yeah, he really did. 14 carries for 75 yards. And in the first half, he had four carries for 20. So, you know, the second half, and you said it well, Mike, the first drive of the second half, when they set the tempo, came right down the field. Mike Teal, you know, led a great drive for Greg Schiano's offense. They did a nice job of putting the pass and run together and really put this game away. I wonder what Stan Brock at Army, who has a bye this week, uh, is thinking if he's watching this broadcast, saying, wow, Rutgers team is a lot better than the record indicates. Rutgers, four and five. Martinek finds the end zone. Another touchdown for Rutgers. That first drive in the second half, they won 12 plays, 82 yards. Martinek scored. He does it again. Yeah, he does it again. And good running inside the five-yard line. They went to Joe three times, and he finally... Bounced it from the middle down to the right side and followed those big offensive linemen. And they pushed this lead to 48 to 16. You can see Greg Schiano still keeping that intensity up on the sidelines because this isn't the last game they have to do this. They have to continue out and win yeah. two more. Jim Levitt wondering what the heck happened here today. Mentioned the 82 yard drive. They just won 67 that time and San Santee is getting a lot of practice in the extra point department. Joe Martinick, a couple of touchdowns today, and right now it's 49-16. Rutgers on top. 38 yards, John, 332 to go. Is he going to get his hands on the football again? I don't know. I, <laughs> for Rutgers, you, you'd want him to, but uh, you know what an afternoon Mike Teal had and Joe Martinick's had and Kenny Britt with the, you know, great receptions, two big plays for him. So, in this defense, you can't say enough about how this defense really shut down Matt Grothy in the offense, the explosive offense for the Bulls. Teddy Delagana with another kick. Keeps this away. And Cedric Hill, the tight end, no catches today for the second straight game. This is the second kickoff return. So he's had a couple of opportunities to at least touch the football and run it. And you look at the beginning of the season, the first seven and the last three. Wow, talk about a tale of two seasons for Greg Schiano's team. Yeah, it really wasn't pretty. The first seven games, two and five, only 117 total points. In the last three games, they go undefeated, 3-0, and 138 points. So what a big turnaround for the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. They really found a way to hit that on switch, and now they want to keep it on for two more weeks. As a quarterback, John, it goes to show you how much the running game complements the passing game, vice versa. Because uh, Teal, they rank eighth in the Big East rushing the football. But, I mean, a lot of that goes to the early part of the season. But now Teal, who was missing by a yard, a yard and a half with some of these long passes, he's been red hot, and now the running game picks it up. Yeah, it really has. It, it, it runs in cycles that way. When one part of the offense picks it up, it seems like the other part is not you know, so far behind. And Mike Teal made some big plays in the last three or four weeks, and the running game's been very close to to getting on par with the passing game. Well, 2.51 to go. Let's take a look now at the game-changing performance brought to you by Pontiac. Yeah, Jason McCurdy did a nice job of turning this game around on the on the pick after the bobble. He takes it the distance, 30 yards for the touchdown, and then he had the, uh, the gift wrap one. He had to go up and fight for it, but gets good pressure on the pocket, but the two interceptions really turned this game around. Well, look at the yardage, huh? First half versus second half. Yeah, Rutgers did a great job of turning up the heat in the second half. 296 total yards. Grant Gregory in at quarterback down for the Bulls, the son of the offensive coordinator. Nice job of picking up a first down. Penalty flag down, dropped at the 45, right as he went out of bounds. So Tom Tomzak, the referee, having a busy afternoon as well. Along with the kickers, Joe Martnick, <laughs> Mike Teal. It's going to be a nice ride back for Rutgers, though, back up to uh, Piscataway. Block in the back. 21 offense. 10-yard penalty. Second down. Well, I, I thought just, this was going to go against the defense. I did, too. Just off the top of my head, Mike, I mean, that's got to be the fourth or fifth play that Jim Levitt's offense has had a big play come back, you know, a 20-plus play come back in, in penalties. And now you said Grant Gregory in the game, the father of the offensive coordinator, Greg Gregory, on the season 5 of 10 for 54 yards. Hasn't had a lot of playing time, but this, these Bulls have really hurt themselves with nine penalties for 90 yards today. Yeah, the most penalized team coming in. 
average about eight and a half penalties, so that's just a little over. But again, the numbers offensively and defensively are so strong, and turnovers, I guess, really sums up this game in the first half. Second down. So Matt Grothy. It's not a good feeling. You know, it's not a good feeling when you come in and you you've had a great week of practice and. You, the game started pretty well for you, but you have so many tip balls and so many bad things happen to you. And you felt like you didn't play that poorly, but they just didn't make enough plays to overcome the penalties and the turnovers. Gregory finds his man, Blanchard, over the 50-yard line. Now Gregory with a nice high school career in Athens, Ohio. Went to Indiana Gregory playing the Big Ten transferring down here to South Florida. There's Mike Thiel, another big game for him. Yeah, he did a nice job of really building on what he's done the last couple of weeks and you know coming out that explosive game he had at Pittsburgh and they struggled a little bit last week against Syracuse early in the game but he did a great job of coming back today and making big plays. You know John you've had some uh, very interesting guests conversations in Jimmy's corner. I don't know if Greg Chiano allows his players to talk. But he'd be an interesting one. Mike Teal, what he went through early in the season uh, compared to what he's going through right now. Well, you'd love to, you know, have that opportunity Take next Friday when we go up and visit with Greg Shiano to talk waiting. about, you know, the, the the toughness of Mike Teal as quarterback because it wasn't easy for him early, but he's come back strong and he never lost faith. And that's what you have to give credit to this coaching staff for and really buying into what they were selling. And they never lost this team. And you can tell how hard they played today. It's Mo Plancher uh, with the carry. So Teal continues to uh, climb and chase Ryan Hart as far as the uh, all-time passing list at Rutgers. Inside a minute now before they put this one in the books. Sooner the better for the Bulls. Gregory buying some time, doing a nice job. Finds his man at the 25-yard line. Nice pass. And it's complete to Patrick Richardson. Time now for our Hampton Inn a winning play of the game. For Rutgers, it was just Mike Teal throwing it up to his big tight end. Jamar Graves wide open after the play fake. Everybody wearing green was looking in the backfield. And it was just an easy pitch and catch from Mike Teal, who really complimented his afternoon. That was an exclamation point to Graves. Gregory doing a nice job finding his receivers. And this one could move the chains. He's just shy of a first down. Looks like he has a nice arm. He's doing a nice job coming out and moving the football. Showing his athletic ability as well. Rolling out a little bit when he found some pressure. And now they've got a timeout with 28 seconds remaining in the game. Trying to get some points on. They know it's a uh, effort and futility right now, but trying to get some points. Greg Shano watching his quarterback, Mike Teal, rack up 294 yards, three touchdowns, two interceptions today. And Rutgers. Climb back to the 500 mark uh, overall. They'll go to five and five, but four and two in the Big East. And of course, as John mentioned, uh, we'll have the Scarlet Knights in the Big East game of the week next Saturday from Piscataway. Our first visit up there this year. That's right. And the Black Knights of Army, non-conference game. And then Louisville, Louisville and Rutgers. It's going to be interesting to see how Louisville battles because uh, another tough loss for them last night. Yeah, they're one of those teams that are right on the fringe as well of trying to get bowl eligible. 28 seconds out of the shotgun. Gregory escapes the rush, looks, fires, and there's some bumping and shoving going on at the back of the end zone, but no penalty flag drop. Once again, looking for number 80, that's Patrick Richardson. He's been the intended receiver a lot here this afternoon, considering he only had three catches coming in. Richard Freshman out of Pensacola. Jason McCourty. His brother Devin had two pick sixes. Now Jason gets into the end zone for the first time in his career with the uh, touchdown of the INT in the first half. Another sack, another fumble, and another recovery by Rutgers. Wow. Six turnovers now. Jim Dumont. Well, this defense came to play today, Mike, and they've done a nice job no matter if it's been the, the starting 11. It's, it's our time right now for the defense. They've done a nice job with Manny Abreu getting some pressure 
in that uh, offensive backfield, and then you get the fumble recovery, and Greg Schiano, real happy about this victory, coming on the road down to Tampa and keeping that dream alive. Yeah, we talked about Ryan D'Imperio, the big game he had, three sacks, and then Jim Dumont, the backup linebacker in the mic position, the middle linebacker, picks up the fumble recovery. Here's your final score, Rutgers 49, your USF full 16. So Greg Schiano, Scarlet Knights of Rutgers continue to roll their fourth straight victory, and they go to five and five and four and two now in the Big East Conference. Two games to go on the schedule. They can still finish seven and five. That is an impressive performance by Coach Schiano and the Scarlet Knights. Final score of uh, what was the final score? I lost track of it there. 49 to 16. I lost track of all the offense being run here. <laughs> uh, an unbelievable day for the Scarlet Knights as they beat South Florida and beat them up good. And they keep themselves in the Big East race of all things. This team started one and five, and now they are in the Big East hunt. Chris Cotter along with Ray Lucas and Don McPherson, guys, uh, and, and Ray, I'll start with you. Uh, for Mike Teal to have the type of game he had today, for this team to pour it on in the second half in a close game at halftime on the road, it says a lot about where this team has come from day one to now. Absolutely. And, you know, you got 12 plays, 82 yards he goes. He's finding people wide open in the secondary. And like I said before, in the in halftime, Mike Teal is the key to this turnaround. Starting one and five had a lot to do with the reason why. Look at Kenny Britt. What a great catch. And does have the wheels, I might add, to take it to the house. Impressive play all around for, for, for Rutgers, and, and I agree. Uh, Mike Teal did an outstanding job today. Every opportunity, he took advantage of it. He threw the ball sharp. Just one, one slight mistake early in the game. Other than that, a very sharp game for Mike Teal. 49-16 is the final. Rutgers with the win over South Florida, and it means a lot uh, for this team in the long run. But staying with this game, I mean... The UC, USF turnovers, by the way, killed South Florida. Mistakes, I thought, was 16 days to prepare for this game. Grothy coming off a bad game. I thought he'd be fantastic. He was my beast of the East. I was a complete moron at 11.30 this morning <laughs> for taking him because he did not have a good game, and a lot of credit has to go to that Rutgers front seven for making his life miserable. Yeah, there's no question about it. The Rutgers front seven did an outstanding job of keeping pressure on him and making plays. The line of scrimmage, you saw that tip pass uh, and also the couple of the interceptions, and Ryan D'Imperio, was outstanding in the rush. You see him here with one of his three sacks on the day, two in the same series. Here comes the second one on Grothy, a very elusive quarterback, an outstanding job of this Rutgers defense, and especially the defensive front, staying in his face and making opportunities for secondaries and linebackers. Jason McCourty with an interception for a touchdown, too defensively, yet, yet, yet even more for that Rutgers defense to hang their head on. You know, Shiano, defensive guy, always wants to chop wood, had to have been very disappointed with the way this team played. You think Fresno State, you think North Carolina, Boy, they've come full circle with this one Absolutely. today. Absolutely, and I don't really so much as put it on the defense right to start because when you're turning the ball over, your offense is giving it away. You're on the field for quite a long period of time. You do get tired and you do get frustrated. The best thing about Rutgers, what they did all year long, is they pointed the thumb, not the finger. It's easy to go like that. It's a lot harder to check yourself, look in the mirror, and try to strike the ship. Nine turnovers now in the last two games. This is a Rutgers team that forced one turnover before this last game last week. Now all of a sudden nine, and they were, they were I think they were 118th, literally, in uh, Division I, <laughs> yeah. 1A football last in forcing turnovers. And now all of a sudden they're getting that thing going, and this is what happens when you force those turnovers. Yeah, and, and what happens when you start forcing turnovers, two things happen. One, one, the defense starts to get more opportunistic, so guys are looking to make plays. Defensive linemen getting their hands up, linebackers taking a chance on, on getting in front of passes. And the second thing that happens is that it puts pressure on the offense. They have opportunities, they get the ball in good field position, so they know they better capitalize to keep the defense in the ball game the way that they're playing. And that's, that's I think, the one thing that Rutgers has done so well is take advantage of things that the defense has done and the offense capitalize. And right. not to mention, Donnie, I'm sorry, Chris, not to mention, did you see the swarm of Rutgers yes. defense? There's not just one guy making tackles. There's five or six guys around the ball. Let's not get, you know, mistake this for any reason. USF is a good football team. The record may not show it. And, yes, I think it has a lot to do with the quarterback play because, obviously, Matt Grothy, let's not forget, they had two field goals 
that were blocked. One was blocked, one was missed. Two fumbles. I mean, you can't turn the ball over that many times and expect to be in the game, any game. All right, take a look at what Rutgers has coming up because I know it's crazy to say after a one and five start, but yet they are still in not only in bowl contention and really in bowl contention now after this road win, but they are still in real contention to win the Big East and go to a BCS game. It's not that out of the question. Next week's game against Army, a team that runs the option, so you got to watch out for that, Indeed. but it's a non conference game. Right here, our Big East game of the week. Then Louisville at home, certainly a winnable game. And if you do that, then you really can start scoreboard watching. Cincinnati, the big one. You know, a lot of dominoes have to fall here, guys. But if Cincinnati loses to Pitt next week in a huge game, then we're talking about a situation where, okay, then you look at West Virginia. What do they have? Pittsburgh has a tough schedule down the stretch. It's all very possible, Ray. And, and it's, it's kind of scary. And, and I think it would be in a historic season as Rutgers, if you start one and five and you're at the end of the season, you're in contention to win the Big East. <laughs> I mean, come on. You can't, you can't make it up. I mean, you, you can't. Well, I, I think that speaks to something that, that when you talk to a lot of coaches in the Big East that, that they mentioned earlier in the season that this conference beats each, each other up. And that opens the door, makes opportunities for teams like Rutgers to come back later on in the season because it is such a competitive league all, mm -hmm. over, all across the board. The only team that's really not competitive this year is Syracuse. Oh. I mean, Louisville's on a slide right now, but, but Syracuse is the oh, only Syracuse. team that has oh. not been competitive all year. Why you got to do that to him? You're on I mean, a pedestal right I'm now. I'm just saying, he's got the red tie on. I feel good about well, myself. Well, you got the red tie well, on. And when we come back, <laughs> back to Tampa for more on Rutgers' fourth straight win. Chris Carlin joins us from Raymond James Stadium, and we'll preview the only other game game in the Big East schedule UConn and Syracuse tonight at the Dome. All right, let's go to the highlights. Raymond James Stadium. Both quarterbacks struggling early, but Mike Teal what? getting Rutgers on the board what? first <laughs> with the draw play. Seven to nothing. Scarlet Knights later Bulls down 7-3. Matt Grothy third and six. Picked off by Jason McCord. That's his first career interception. He wants more than just a pick, though. He wants six, and he gets it into the end zone. Rutgers up 14-3. to three. Back come the Bulls, though. Three minutes to play. Grothy giving it to Ben Williams. Look at this guy. Bench press is over 600 pounds. Why? Because <laughs> he wants to. It's the only reason why yeah, you would bench press 600 yeah. pounds. Yeah. Let's bring 14, him on the set. All right, 30 seconds left in the half. This is a big score momentum-wise. Rutgers picks it up. Jack Corcoran with the score 21-10. To the second half, opening drive for Rutgers. Second and goal after marching down the field. Joe Martinek what, what busts in from a yard out. What a day he had. 28-10 nights. Ensuing South Florida drive. Grothy. At times, he was good today. This is a beautiful pass That's right here. Pass. Where only his, his guy can get it. Torres Johnson, the touchdown, 20-yard strike, 28-16, missing the extra point. South Florida gets the ball right back, driving. Grothy, it's Jesse Hester Jr. <laughs> oh, my That's word. Awesome. Mistakes, mistakes, mistakes. Levitt lost his voice before they even took the field today in the first quarter. Couldn't even believe it. Mike Teal, two of them, as he throws the pass. Touchdown. And we'll go to the score. We'll show you the rest of the highlights later. Right. There. I thought that was in the Twilight Zone. There it was for not a second. shaky ending for Rutgers. It was a solid ending. Good one, though, Don. 49 to 16. <laughs> Rutgers improves to 5 and 5 overall, and maybe even more importantly, 4 and 2 in conference as they keep themselves alive for the Big East Championship. Take a look at the standings right now. You got Cincy at 4 and 1. They've already won this week. Pittsburgh 3 and 1. West Virginia 3 and 1. Those two teams still have to play in the backyard brawl. Cincinnati's in that mix as well. Rutgers has one more Big East game against Louisville at home. Final weekend of the season, Thanksgiving weekend. And then they can sit back and kind of watch the rest of it happen. Let's go out right now to Chris Carlin down in Tampa who called the game. And Chris, let me ask you that very question right now. Can this Rutgers team even begin to start thinking, hey, we're in this Big East mix? You know, I think right now, Chris, I, I don't know that you can because I think Cincinnati has played so well as they have. But I think where they are at four and two, and having won four in a row, you know, the bigger picture for them right now is, you know, where the season was as opposed to where it is now. I mean, five and five. You know, you win four in a row for the first time since 2006, and they're just rolling. And today in the second half, I mean, they just they dominated uh, South Florida. Yeah, South Florida made a ton of mistakes. There's no question about it. Penalties, six turnovers on the day. Matt Grothy had all kinds of problems, but you know what? At the same time, they forced a lot of those problems with the pressure uh, that they got on Grothy, and they forced a lot of those mistakes, too. See, Matt, great, Lucas. Uh, qu quick question. Watching the game, even though when Teal threw that pick, you're looking on the sideline, I was trying to look at the players' faces. 
I didn't see any finger point, nobody getting down. Did you see any of that from your vantage point where you were sitting? You mean on, on the Rutgers sideline? Yep, yep. Yeah, none, Ray. I mean, that hasn't been a, a, an issue most of the season. I mean, you know, they haven't run into that at all. These guys, you know, Britt and Underwood, and those guys understand uh, what Mike's all about, and they have never kind of wavered from him at all, even when he was struggling earlier in the year. You know, I think the thing that they have forged is a very good working relationship where they're going to take some shots occasionally, and they're not the best throws you want to make, but at the same time, they're also going to take huge plays like they did later in the game, I think. That's one thing that really stands out is uh, this is a group that is very unified and there's never been any finger pointing even when they were one in five. Hey, hey Chris Don McPherson here on the other side of the ball. I mentioned at the top of uh, top of the show that on top of the game that that there was a players only meeting for South Florida. What did you see on the sideline for South Florida as things began to fall apart? Were there finger pointing? Were the heads being held high or low? What was the tone on the sideline for South Florida? There's no question those heads were low, and there were some guys who were very upset with what was go with what was going on. I don't know if you guys caught it right before the half. They were lining up for that field goal attempt for 54 yards, and Cedric Hill, who's the tight end on the team, was yelling at the sideline they didn't have their long snapper out on the field oh, wow. and he was losing it and you i mean for a field goal how did that happen at the same time you have receivers down the field throwing their arms up in the air when Grothy's not hitting them Taurus Johnson did that twice today I think that's a team right now that is very much at a crossroads having lost four out of five after starting a year at five and oh you have to wonder about what's going on with the uh, with the Bulls at the moment you know, Chris I know stats can be misleading at times but you can't ignore the fact that this Rutgers defense forced one turnover in the first eight games and now they force nine in the last two for a defensive guy like Shiano he has to preach that every single day have they done anything differently is it just uh, suddenly execution is starting to work for him it's just one of those things where it happens you know it's not execution it's something that the, you work on all the time you're trying to get the ball loose you do the best you can and sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't because I think part of it is crediting the other team with doing a good job on ball security but you know it seems to me that they've come in bunches and it's it's no mistake that when you look at Rutgers in their five wins this year they have forced 13 turnovers and their five losses they have forced none mm -hmm. i mean that tells you exactly uh, what that has been all about and they have been able to cash in on those turnovers this year but well, one player who's really showed up every single game and really every game he's ever played for for Rutgers is kenny Britt. set a record today uh you, you may look back and say he's the greatest receiver ever to wear uh the scarlet and white for Rutgers. how what has he meant to this program and do you think he has a future plan on sundays well, I don't think there's any question he has a future plan on Sundays. It's going to be, is it going to be in another year from now, or is Kenny going to, you know, to make a decision that he's going to go pro early? Who knows? I, I think with his size and his speed, you can absolutely see that. And how about on the 93-yard touchdown, breaking the tackle like he did at the 40-yard line? I mean, that's just a terrific play. Kenny Britt's got 12 100-yard games now in his career, and he continues to climb up the charts. And I don't know if he's going to quite get the receptions record, but he's not going to be that far off, and he passed the yardage record today. All right, Chris, we appreciate it. Safe travels back. All right, guys, be good. All right, Chris Carlin, and that's uh, you know something about Britt, too. He mentioned breaking the tackle and then also running away from the secondary. A guy with that type of size and hands, mm. we've seen the hands, but that he can run away from a South Florida secondary, yeah. too, that's impressive. I, I, I'm blown away with Kenny Britt because, you know, you, 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 you watch this young man play. He's not afraid to go across the middle, and he uses his body better than probably anybody in, in all of college football, but at the same token with that size. And he's not a small character, you know, 200, 10 pound kind of guy can break away and run away from secondaries. You got to admit, this kid can play probably this year in the NFL, but. You know, I know Rutgers fans are hoping that he stays right where he's at. The one thing I like about what Kenny Britt does is he catches the ball with his hands. Correct. He reaches out, Good meets boy. the ball, and mm -hmm. brings it to his body. That's something that NFL coaches love to see, a guy who can catch with his hands. He can use his body for positioning, but he uses his hands very, very well. All right, when we come back, the results are in for two of our picks for Beasts of the East. <laughs> Not a good day <laughs> for us two, but the guy who picked the most obvious one of the day. Yep, I still got to wait and see what happens. Joined now by John Marinetto, new commissioner of the Big East. And uh, John, first of all, let me say congratulations, and then let me ask you what your first order of business is going to be. <laughs> hey, Chris, glad to be with you. Thank you very much. It's a very exciting time, and. Looking forward to, obviously, uh, the future and playing a different role and moving the conference forward. i got to say, as we look back to the 2003 year when we reconstituted the Big East Conference, 
a number of things are on our agenda and on our strategic plan, and we've been able to accomplish so many of them over the past five years, including extending our television contracts into the future um, for both basketball and football, most recently, obviously, having SNY join the family. Um, we also obviously created a number one priority at that point in time of retaining our BCS bowl, the bowl bid, and we've certainly been able to succeed in getting that done. So I guess the next major item on our strategic plan right now is to pounce on the next four-year cycle of postseason bowl opportunities for our membership once the BCF contract is completed and signed. When you do that, are you trying to secure more bowls in terms of just the sheer numbers? Are you trying, uh, is the focus more toward better bowl games maybe? Well, I, I think we've got a pretty good lineup right now, and we've got a total of six, which is the most that we've ever had in the 18-year history of our football league. So from a number standpoint, we're in pretty good shape. Six, six you know, with Notre Dame lined up with us in a solid position. But um, and moving forward, we want to we wanna try and improve our lineup if we can, maybe by adding one in the middle of the pack in order to give everyone an opportunity based on where they, where they fall at the end of the year to have a great experience at the end of the year. And that, that's ultimately our objective as we pursue this, this item on the agenda. John, so many leagues have gone to the 12-team format. I know that certainly that was brought up when you know, Boston College and Miami left for the ACC. Uh, is that ever in the future? Is that so far down the road that right now you wouldn't even consider that having a 12-team league, a championship game? Yeah, there's, there's no item of expansion on our agenda. Uh, it's not talked about among our members, and we're, we're, we're pretty content with where we are right now. i got to tell you, though, that the, um, the, the issue would only be revisited if I think our membership felt that there was someone out there that brought us value mm -hmm. that was available to move over. Um, right now, I think that the numbers are very competitive from our perspective and, and, and fit our plan. But if something happened somewhere along the line where someone who was of, of consequence, someone of value, uh, was interested in joining the Big East, then we would revisit that issue. But in terms of getting to the number 12, I don't, I don't see that in our immediate plans at all for the future. Well, John, you've been with the Big East, associated with the conference for a while now, just putting that uh, title of commissioner outside the office door. But you got great timing with basketball season starting. You may be the, your first year as commissioner, maybe the, the greatest year any conference has ever had in college basketball. You got to be excited about that. Isn't it amazing, Chris, how, how phenomenally. We, what, what, what we've made it a practice to do in the past leading up to this year, obviously, is never to say anything that's as out, uh, outrageous and as bold as that we're the best. We leave it to people like you to say that on our behalf. But we're excited, obviously. You look at the standings and you look at the projections and the prognosticators, and, and we're in a position where everyone is talking about us in terms of being the best ever, and that's terrific. All right, Don, pluses and minuses with having a 12-team league and having the championship game. We've certainly seen it with the ACC. Everybody thought it was going to be Miami and Florida State. It hasn't been that way. Do you like the Big East the way it is right now? Do you think it would be more intriguing if you had that couple extra teams and then maybe had that championship game that weekend? I think it, it not only is it going to be more intriguing if they had the, if they had the 12 teams, I think it's going to be necessary as, as, as the college football goes forward and the bowl alliance becomes or the bowl championship series uh, becomes a little bit more complicated. I think the, the, the solutions are going to be, as people talk about playoffs, they're going to be in the conference championship games that will give us something bigger. And I think that's where the Big East will be competitive once they go to 12 teams. You know, Ray, uh, the commissioner though was right when he starts talking about uh, the teams better bring something to the table. We're not just going to go out there and grab teams. So when you look around right. the landscape of college football right now, I mean, th does a Marshall make sense? Do you, you look at Conference USA? Do you look at the MAC Conference maybe? I mean, it, it's not its not exact. It's kind of slim pickings of the teams that are still left out there. Uh, I agree. And, and where are you picking them from? The bottom of the barrel? I mean, the last fourth, fifth, sixth place yeah. teams in that, in that conference? I think it's easy. tough. It's not going to be easy. He will have his work cut out for him. But I do believe, like Don, I think a playoff system will be beneficial to the Big East. So when I played in the Big East, we had the Syracuse, Miami, Boston College, Virginia Tech. It was a powerhouse. And we had the Rutgers. I mean, because I was there, but anyway, I'm saying it was a powerhouse, and I think they're going back to that right now. So, I mean, yes, I think 12 teams would benefit everybody. Really. All right, our beasts of the East, and Ray took the easy way out on this one. Oh, he just decided he was going to take a player. He's going to take a player that just wasn't going to play until after we were off the air. Exactly. There's no way to validate it, but I, I will go back to, to my one. This is your guy. Yeah, this yeah, is this, my this guy. Is you can have him if you want. <laughs> uh, Brophy was my guy. I thought having 16 days to prepare, you know,